On Rosh Hashanah last week, I spoke of the of the of my realization many months ago that the pandemic had effectively closed off my heart to the outside world. I spoke of how, in the process of building physical walls of safety, I also built walls around my heart. I spoke of the ways we numb, distance, and ignore our heart's cries, and of how we need to break down those walls to live life fully, to really experience life as opposed to letting it pass us by. To do so, we have to inhabit the space of the wilderness, I taught. The place that Brene Brown describes as the untamed, unpredictable place of solitude and searching. A place as dangerous as it is breathtaking. A place as sought after as it is feared. The wilderness can often feel unholy, she says, because we can't control it. Or what people think about our choice of whether to venture into that vastness or not. But it turns out to be the place of true belonging. And it's the bravest and most sacred place you will ever stand. It's in this place of wilderness that we become fully present to our needs and desires, courageously calling out to the universe and being met, as the psalmist states, with expansiveness. And it's here that I want to pick up this evening. Because I know that sometimes, even when we want to open ourselves up to the world, it can be incredibly hard to actually take that first step. To not only decide to step into the wilderness, but to leave, as it says of Avraham Avinu, your land, the land of your birth, and the house of your father. What prevents us from taking this first step, that step that we, that, we, that we want to take, that maybe we know we need to take in our lives? How might we move forward in this wilderness to really live life? Tonight, there are three main barriers that I want to focus on. Overwhelm, fear, and the stories that we tell ourselves. First off, the feeling of overwhelm and exhaustion can make journeying into the wilderness daunting, if not downright impossible. Have you ever had those moments when you're sick and tired, when the piles keep piling up on your desk and at the same time in the sink? Those days where it takes everything that you have to get through the day, and there certainly in that space isn't any room for additional emotional expenditure that's required to actually sit in a place of vulnerability. When our emotional tanks are running empty, we need to find a way to fuel up. Time away, reading a good book, a deep conversation with a close friend, or even something as simple as sitting at the kitchen table with a cup of warm coffee or tea gazing out the window can help us over time to have the capacity to engage and connect deeply with others. And this is essential. We can't thrive when we have an empty tank. And at its core, this is what Shabbat and our communities are about as well. It's an acknowledgement that we need to create that palace and time each week to connect to refresh, to yinafash, to resoul ourselves. By creating that space for Shabbat in our lives, we reconnect with our essential selves. And it reminds us that at our core, we are human beings, not human doings. We have to create the time to just be. Recharging our capacity for emotional openness is only the first step. Often as we're about to step into that wilderness, fear appears as our arch enemy and maybe also our friend. And with it comes often with the ideas, the feelings of comfort and familiarity. We fear failure or rather being failures. We fear success of how our lives may change if we actually do succeed in whatever we're embarking upon. We fear being seen at the same time as we desperately long for it, fearing that maybe we're not enough, we're not worthy of love, we weren't meant to be happy. We fear the feeling of loneliness, of being disconnected from ourselves and others. These fears come by many names, but they all point at those deep needs 
that each and every one of us have in our lives. The needs to, be, to belong, to be seen, to be loved. Jen Hatmaker, a pastor and writer, beautifully expresses this fear, teaching that standing on the precipice of the wilderness is bone-chilling. Because belonging is so primal, so necessary, the threat of losing your tribe or going alone feels so terrifying as to keep most of us distanced from the wilderness our whole lives. Human approval is one of our most treasured idols, and the offering we must lay at its hungry feet is keeping others comfortable. I'm convinced that discomfort is the greatest deterrent of our generation. The truth is, though, that this fear isn't only a problem of our generation. We see this deep truth in the Israelites who leave Egypt. As I mentioned last week, the book of Numbers tells of the 12 spies who journeyed to scout out the land of, of, of Israel. After 40 days, they return with a giant cluster of grapes and report that the land is indeed fruitful. It is flowing with milk and honey. But the land is filled with giants. And how could we, us grasshoppers, possibly conquer the land? This fear is most present in Caleb and Joshua's response to the now terrified people, telling them that if the Lord is pleased with us, God will bring us into that land, a land that flows with milk and honey, and give it to us. Only you must not rebel against the Lord. Have no fear of them, of the people of that country, for they are our prey. Their protection has departed from them, but the Lord is with us. Have no fear. On the verge of entering the promised land, their fear of failure gets the best of them. And as a result, none of them enter the land. But there's another side of this story that I think sheds an entirely different light. The Alter Rebbe, the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, teaches us that what they were afraid of was not failure of being conquered, but they were, what they were afraid of is success. Now think about it for a moment. They just spent all of this time wandering in the wilderness. God has existed in their midst, and yes, they were wandering for a while, but they didn't have anything to worry about. They had food for every single meal. They knew exactly when to get up and leave and when to be put back down. They didn't have to think about anything. And what the Alter Rebbe teaches is that these ten heads of the tribes were afraid that when they got into the land of Israel, they would lose that connection with God in the work that it takes to actually build up the land, in the work that it takes to plant the fields, to build a system of justice, to build a place to worship God that they would forget about what they were actually doing, who is at the center of their communities, namely God. At the core, they were comfortable with the way things were. They had gotten used to the desert and its journey, and even the familiarity, as hard as it may have been, of Egypt was preferable for them to the unknowns of having to build up the land. They as we often do, choose what is known over the unknown of the possible of the place, over the place of openness and expansiveness. And that's why comfort and familiarity conspire with fear to keep us in that closed place. Other than in the most dire of circumstances, we'd often rather take what is known with all of its joy and pain over the discomfort of stepping out into that wilderness, even if that wilderness means doing the things that we were put here on this earth to do, the things that we enjoy most in this world. And in that way, we're not so different from those Israelites who never left Egypt. Oh, you, you didn't hear about those Israelites? We don't talk about them often. But there's an old midrash in the Mechilta, which teaches that only one in five Israelites actually left Egypt. Which means four in five Israelites, 80% of the Israelites in Egypt, chose the comfort, or the familiarity rather, of slavery in Egypt over the journey to the promised land. But our inheritance, those of us who are sitting here today, 
are of those Israelites who left, who made the journey, who, like Nachshon, took that step into the water, not knowing if it would part. Our story is of journey into wilderness. Finally, the stories that we tell to ourselves and about ourselves, our ancestors, our families, our communities, help to define who we think we are and who we may yet become. These stories are shaped by the experiences of our lives, the losses we've experienced, those moments when our hearts have been broken and our failures, as well as those moments of success, of love, of connection, and of affirmation. These stories give our lives meaning and give rise to the things that we believe about the world and our agency within it. Now, some of these beliefs, some of these stories are liberating. They propel us forward in the world. They help us do our life's work. But others of them are limiting. They hold us back from being ourselves and from inhabiting that place of true belonging in the wilderness. We tell ourselves things like, well, it's because I'm not lovable. It's because I'm not good enough to be associated with this person or I'm not deserving of that raise or the respect of my family or my colleagues. These beliefs have been developed in our lives as a way of protection, but they don't always protect us, and we often hold on to them long after they're actually helpful. And so these stories that we tell us that are holding us back, we need to find ways to reframe. We need to externalize them and ask ourselves, are they really true? And are they really helping us to become the fullest me that I can be in this world? As Brene Brown points out, our task this time of year is to shed the armor around our hearts, those stories, those things that we keep with us that serve as a barrier to true belonging. She writes, many of us armor up as a way to protect ourselves as children. Once we grow into adults, we start to realize that the armor is preventing us from growing into our gifts and ourself. Just like we can strengthen our courage muscle for a stronger back by examining our need to be perfect and please others at the expense of our own life, we can exercise the vulnerability muscle that allows us to soften and stay open rather than attack and defend. This means getting comfortable with vulnerability. But most of the time we approach life with an armored front for two reasons. We're not comfortable with emotions and we equate vulnerability with weakness. And or two, our experiences of trauma have taught us that vulnerability is actually dangerous. Violence and oppression have made our soft front a liability and we struggle to find a place emotionally and physically safe enough to be vulnerable. The definition of vulnerability is uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. But vulnerability, she writes, is not a weakness. It's our most accurate measure of courage. When the barrier is our belief about vulnerability, the question becomes, are we willing to show up and be seen when we can't control the outcome? When the barrier to vulnerability is about safety, the question becomes, are we willing to create courageous spaces so we can be fully seen? She finishes, a soft, in front, a soft and open front is not being weak. It's being brave. It's being the wilderness. This is the opportunity of tonight, the opportunity of Kol Nidre, the opportunity of these 25 hours. What stories do you tell of yourself that you wish to carry with you in this new year? And what are the stories that are no longer helpful for us, those stories that we want to shed behind, just as we shedded those vows of this past year? What are the fears that hold us back, that are not actually justified or true, that we might want to transform into opportunities? And the question is, by Naila. Are we ready to step in to these new stories? Are we ready to step into this transformed self, this returned self, 
this alive self. And that also is my blessing for us. May we be fully present in our time together. May we lift up our voices. May we reflect on our year, on our lives, on our stories. And may we continue to grow in this day and in the days to come. Gamar Chatimatova.